live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering Spark Summit East 2017, brought to you by Databricks. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Welcome back to Boston, everybody. This is Spark Summit East, hashtag Spark Summit, and this is theCUBE. Jan Stojka is here, he's the executive chairman of Databricks and professor of computer science at UCAL Berkeley. I, I just, the smarts is rubbing off of me. I always feel smart when I co-host <laughs> with George. And, you know, and having you on, it's just a pleasure. So thanks very much for Thank taking the time. Thank you for having on. me. So love the, the talk this morning. We learned about uh, Rise Labs. We're going to talk about that, which is son of AMP. You may be uh, the father of, uh, <laughs> of those two. So again, welcome. Um, give us the update. You, great keynote this morning. How's the vibe? How are you feeling? I think it's great, and um, you know, thank you, and thank everyone for uh, uh, attending this summit. It's uh, a lot of energy, a lot of interesting discussions, and uh, a lot of ideas around. Um, so I'm very happy about how things are going. Yeah, so, um, so well, let's start with, uh, with RISE uh, Labs. Um, maybe take us back to those who don't know, understand sort of the, the birth of AMP, and, and what you were trying to achieve there, and what's next. Yeah, so, um, the AMP was a six-year project uh, at Berkeley, and it involved around eight faculties and over the duration of the lab, around 60 students and postdocs. And the mission of the AMP lab was to make sense of, the, of, of big data. Uh, AMP lab started in uh, 2000, um, I mean, 2009, and um, at the end of 2009, and the, the premise is that in order to make sense of this big data, we need a holistic approach which involves um, algorithms, in particular machine learning algorithms, uh, machines, means systems, large scale systems, and the people, crowdsourcing. And more precisely, the goal was to build a stack, data analytics stack for interactive analytics, uh, to be used uh, across industry and uh, ac uh, academia. And of course, being at Berkeley, it has to be open source. <laughs> uh, so that's basically what was uh, AMP Lab, and it was a birthplace for Apache Spark. That's why we are all here today. Right. That's, uh, and uh, a few other open source uh, systems, like um, Mesos, Apache Mesos, and uh, a look show is now, is, which was previously called uh, Tachyon. And um, so AMP Lab ended at the, in December last year. And in January, J January this January, we started a new lab which is called RISE. RISE stands for uh, Real Time Intelligent Secure uh, Execution. And uh, the premise of the new lab is that um, actually, the real value in the data is a decision you can make on the data. And you can see this more and more at almost every organization. They want to use their data to make some decision to improve their business processes, application services, or come up with new application and services. But then, if you think about that, what does it mean that they emphasize on the decision? Then it means that you want decision to be fast, because fast decisions are better than slower decisions. You want decisions to be on fresh data, on live data, because decisions on the data I have right now are in general better than decisions on the data from yesterday or last week. And then you also want to make targeted, personalized decisions, because the decisions on personal information are better than on aggregate information. Uh, so that's fundamental premise. So therefore, you want to build platforms, tools, and algorithms to enable intelligent, real-time decisions on live data with strong security. And the security is a, a big emphasis of the lab because it means to provide privacy, confidentiality, and integrity. And as you know, as you, you hear about data breaches or things like that every day. So for an organization, it's extremely important to provide privacy and confidentiality to their users. And it's not only because the users want that, but it's also indirectly can help them to improve their service. Because if I guarantee your data is confiden confidential with me, 
you are probably much more willing to share some of your data with me. And if you share some of the data with me, I can build and provide better services. So um, that's basically, in a nutshell, what the lab is and what the focus okay, is. Okay, so you said three things, fast, live, and targeted. So fast means you can affect the outcome. Yes. Uh, live data means it's better quality, and then targeted and, and means it's relevant. Yes. Okay, and then my question on security, I felt like when cloud and big data came to four, security became a do-over. Is, <laughs> is that a fair assessment, uh, uh, you doing it over? Or as, as yeah. Bill Clinton would call it, a mulligan. I mean, yeah, you get a mulligan <laughs> on, on security. Yeah, I think, you know, security, it's, 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 a, it's always a difficult topic because it means so many things for so many people. Mm -hmm. Um, so, there are instances in actually cloud is quite secure. It's actually cloud can be more secure than some on-prem deployments. Um, in fact, if you hear about these uh, data leaks or uh, security breaches, most of, you know, you don't hear them happening in the cloud. And there are some reasons for that, right? It's because, you know, they have uh, trained people, you know, they are paranoid about this, they do certification maybe much more often and things like that. Uh, but still, you know, the state of security is not that great, right? For instance, you know, if I compromise your operating system, whether it's in cloud or, in, or you are not in the cloud, I can do anything. Right, or your VM, right? Is right. You, you run on, in all these clouds, you run on a VM, and now you are going to run on some containers, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, there are a lot of uh, um, attacks, or there are attacks, sophisticated attacks, in which you, your data is encrypted, but if I can look at uh, the access patterns, how much data you transfer, or how much data you access from memory, um, then I can infer something about what you are doing about your queries, right? If it's more data, maybe it's a query on New York. If it's less data, it's probably maybe some small, like something at Berkeley. So you can, you can infer from all multiple queries just looking at the access. So it's, it's a difficult problem. Um, but fortunately, again, there are some new technologies which are developed and some new algorithms which gives us some hope. One of the most interesting technology which is happening today is uh, hardware enclaves. So with hardware enclaves, you can execute the code within this enclave, which is hardware protected. And even if your operating system or VM is compromised, it cannot access your code, which runs into this enclave. And uh, Intel has Intel SGX, and we are working and collaborating with them uh, actively. Um, ARM has Trust Zone, and AMD also announced they are going to have a similar technology in their chips. So that's kind of very, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, very interesting and uh, very promising development. I think the other one, uh, the other aspect in which you know, it's a focus of the lab, is that even with these hardware enclaves, it doesn't automatically solve the problem because if I, the code itself has a vulnerability, yes, I can run the code in the hardware enclave, but the code can send out right. <laughs> data, you know, uh, right, the uh, outside. A more yeah. granular so, perimeter, right? Yeah, so. You, yeah. So, so, yeah, so you, you know, we are looking and uh, there are security experts in the, in the new lab looking at this, maybe how to uh, split the application so you run only a small part in it in the enclave, which is a critical part, and you can make sure that it's also the code is secure, and the rest of the code you run outside, but the rest of the code can, it's, it's, it's only going to work on data which is encrypted, right? So, you know, there is a lot of interesting research, but you know, that's and, good. And, 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 and does blockchain fit in there as well? Yeah, or? I think blockchain yeah. is a very interesting technology, and again, it's uh, real time in that area. It's also very interesting uh, yeah, right. directions, <laughs> absolutely. So you guys, I, I want, to, George, you would to, you shared with me sort of what you were calling a new workload. So you had batch and you have interactive and now you've got continuous. Continuous, and you, yes. And I know that's a topic that you want to discuss and, and I'd love to hear more about that. But George, tee it up. Well, okay, so we were talking um, earlier and, and the, the objective of RISE is you know, fast and, and continuous type yes. decisions. And this is different from the traditional, you either do it batch, you do it interactive. Yep. So um, maybe, to tell us about some applications where that is one workload among the tr the other 
traditional workloads. And, and then let's unpack that a little more. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you a few, uh, a few applications. So it's, it's more than continuously, you interact with the environment continuously, but you also learn continuously. Um, I'll give you some, uh, some examples. Uh, so for instance, uh, you know, an example, think about um, you, are, uh, you want to detect um, a network security attack and respond uh, and diagnose and defend in real time. So what this means that you need to continuously uh, get uh, logs from the network and from the more endpoints you can get, the better, right? Um, because the more data will help you to, to detect things faster. But then you need to detect the new pattern and you need to learn the new patterns because new security attacks, which are the ones which are effective, are slightly different from the, the past one because you hope that you already have defense in place for the past ones. So now you, you, you are going to learn that and then you are going to react. You may push patches in real time. You may push uh, filters. Uh, installing new filters to firewalls. So that's kind of an application is going in, in real time. Um, another application can be about you know, self-driving. Now, self-driving makes tremendous strides and a lot of algorithms, you know, the very smart algorithms, now they are implemented uh, on, in, on the cars, right? All the system is on the cars. But imagine now that you want to uh, continuously get the information from this car aggregate and learn, and then send back the information you learn or uh, to the cars. Like for instance, if it's uh, an accident, a roadblock, uh, an object which is dropped on the highway. So you can learn from the other cars which, uh, what they've done in that situation. Maybe in some cases a driver took an evasive action, right? Maybe you can monitor also the cars which are not self-driving but driven by the humans. And then you learn that in real time, and then the other cars, which follows through the same, uh, you know, uh, confront with the same situation, they now, they now know what to do, right? So this is, it's again, I want to emphasize this, not only continuous sensing environment and making the decisions, but a very important component about learning. Let me take you back to the security example as I, as I sort of process the auto yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. So, in the security example, it doesn't sound like, I mean, if you have a vast network, you know, endpoints, software, you know, infrastructure, you're not going to have one God model looking out at everything. Yes. So I assume that means there are models distributed everywhere and they don't know what a new, necessarily what an entirely new attack pattern looks like. So. In other words, for that isolated model, it doesn't know what it doesn't know. I don't know if that's yes. what Rumsfeld yes, called yeah, it or yeah. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how does it know what to pass back yes. for retraining? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so there are many aspects and there are many, uh, many things you can, you can look at. Um, and it's again, this is not, it's a research problem, so I cannot give you the solution now. I can hypothesize and I give you some examples. But for instance, you can, you can look about and you correlate, you know, on some, uh, by observing the effects, some of the, some of the effects of the attacks are visible. Uh, in some cases, you denial of service attack. That's pretty clear. Uh, even the worst and so forth, uh, they maybe cause computers to crash, right? So once you see uh, some, this kind of anomaly, right, anomalies, uh, on the end devices, end host, and things like that. Maybe reported by humans, right? Um, then you can try to correlate with what kind of traffic you got, right? And from there, from that correlation, probably you can, uh, and hopefully, you can develop some models so to identify what kind of traffic, where it comes from, what is the content, and so forth, which causes behavior, anomalous behavior. And where is that correlation happening? I think it will happen everywhere, right? Because at the edge and at the center. Absolutely. And right. then it, I assume that it sounds like the models, both at the edge and at the center, are ensemble models because yes. you're tracking different behavior. Yes, you are going to track a different behavior, and you are going to 
I think that's, that's a good uh, hypothesis. And then you are going to assemble them, it's assembled to come up with the best uh, decision. Okay, so now let's wind forward, wind forward to the car example. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like there's a mesh network. Um, at least the Peter Levine's sort of talk was there's near local compute resources and you can use Bitcoin to pay for yeah. it or, or blockchain or however yeah. it works. But that sort of topology we haven't really encountered before in computing, have we? And how, I yeah. guess, how imminent is that sort of? I think that some of the stuff you can do today in the cloud. I think if you want super low latency, probably you need to have more computation towards the edges. But if I'm thinking that I want kind of reactions on tens, hundreds of milliseconds, uh, in theory you can do it today with the cloud infrastructure we have. And if you, if you think about, uh, in many cases, you know, if you can do it within a few hundreds of milliseconds, it's still super useful, right? To avoid uh, some object, you know, which, which was dropped on the highway. Um, you know, if I have a few hundred milliseconds, uh, many cars will be effectively avoid that, having that information. Let's have that conversation about the edge a little further one we have an off camera. <laughs> so there's a debate in our community about how much data will stay at the edge, how much will go into the cloud. Uh, David Floyer said 90% of it will stay at, at the edge. Your comment was it depends on the value. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I think that depends who, who am I and how I perceive the value of the data. Um, and you know, and what's the, what can be the value of the data? Is this is what I was saying. I think that the value of the data is fundamentally what kind of decisions, what kind of actions it will enable me to take, right? Um, so here I'm not just talking about you know, uh, credit card information or things like that. Even in that case, there is an action I'm going, you know, you, you know someone is going to take on, on, on that. Right. But um, so, and so if I do believe that the data can provide me uh, with ability to take better actions and uh, or uh, make better decisions. I think that you know I want to I want to keep it. And it's not you know because why I want to keep it because also it's not only the decision it enables enables me now, but everyone is going to continuously uh, improve their algorithm, algorithms, develop new algorithms. And when you do that, how do you test them? You test on the old data, right? Um, so I think that for all these reasons, a lot of data, the valuable data in this sense, is going to go to the cloud. Now, there's a lot of data which will remain on the edges, um, and I think that's, that's fair. But it's again, if a cloud provider or someone who provides a service in the cloud believes that the data is valuable, I do believe that eventually it's going to get to the cloud. So if it's valuable, it will be persisted and it will eventually get to the cloud. And, and we talked about latency, but late, there's a certain, you gave the, the example of a, an evasive action. You, you yeah. can't send that back to the cloud and make the decision, yeah. you have to make it real time, but eventually that data, if it's important, will go back to the cloud. The other question of all this data that we are now processing on a continuous basis, how much actually will get persisted, most of it, much of it probably does not get persisted, right? Is that a fair assumption? Um, or? Yeah, I, I, think, I think so. Um, and probably, you know, is all the data is not equal, right? It's like um, you want to maybe even if you, you know, if you take a continuous video, right, on the car, they have, they, they con continuously, you know, have videos from multiple cameras and radar, lidar, all of this stuff, right, right. it's continuous. And um, if you think about of this one, I would assume that you don't want to send all the data to the cloud, but the data around the, uh, the interesting events you may want to do, right? So before or after the car is, uh, was in the hey, near accident or took an evasive action or the human has had to intervene. So in all these cases, probably I want to send the data to the cloud. But for the most cases, probably not. That's good. Uh, we have to leave it there, but I'll, I'll give you the last word on things that are exciting you, things you're working on, interesting projects. Yeah, so uh, I think this is what, uh, you know, it's really what excites me is about, 
how you are going to have this continuous application, you are going, going to continuously interact with the environment, you are going to continuously learn and improve. And here there are many challenges, and I just want to uh, say a few more there, and one which we haven't discussed. Uh, one, it's about, uh, in general, it's about explainability, right? If these systems augment the human decision process, if these systems uh, are going to make decisions which impact you as a human, you want to know why, right? Uh, like I gave these examples, assuming that you have an, you know, a machine learning algorithms in, make, uh, in making, making a diagnosis on your MRI or you know, X-ray. You want to know why. What is in this X-ray causes that decision, right? If you go to the doctor, they are going to point and show you, okay, this is why you have this condition. So I think this is very important because as a human, you want to understand. And you want to understand not, not only why the decision happens, but you want also to understand what you have, have to do because you, you want to understand what you need to do to do better in the future, right? Like if your mortgage is turned down, uh, application is turned down, I want to know why is that? Because next time when I apply to, mo to the mortgage, I, I want to you know, have a higher chance to, to get it through. So I think that's a very important aspect. And uh, the last thing I will, I, will, I will say is that this is super important and uh, was mentioned, you mentioned, it's about having algorithms which can say, I don't know, right? It's like, okay, I've never seen this situation in the past, so I don't know what to do. This is much better than giving you just a wrong decision, right? Right, or a low probability that you don't know what to do with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Jan, thanks again for coming in theCUBE. It was really a pleasure having you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. All right, keep it right there, thanks. everybody. George and I will be back to do our wrap right after this short break. This is theCUBE, we're live from Spark Summit East. Right back.